thanks for coming, everybody. It's good to see you. Uh, thank you for, for making time in week three and this, this shorter week. That's great. Uh, my name is Owen Salini. I'm the John Perkinson, part of the Tense of Three Host Committee here. Uh, I wanted to remind you that, uh, that this is this today's forum on uh, public policy and uh, relation to homelessness is part of a larger series. It'll carry on through the remainder of winter quarter, uh, addressing issues around uh, policy and services in uh, different communities that are affected by homelessness. I'd encourage you to check those out. Uh, lots of good ways to learn and build our background knowledge as we engage with Tennessee Free. Uh, there's a half sheet up in the back by all the other handouts that, that explains more of, of that programming. Additionally, one other plug, if you have not yet made it down to Tent City 3 to take a tour with class or just drop in and say hello, I'd really encourage you to do that. Uh, Tent City 3 folks are eager to uh, connect with you and, and after we've understood today some of the, the policy and the background issues, uh, putting a face on that really brings the learning together. So I'd encourage you to stop by if you've not done so already. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Sandra Harchi who will introduce our speaker and give us some more context for today. So Sandra, it's you. Thank you. Welcome, uh, thanks for joining us. I'd like to welcome SPU students who in here is in here uh, due to a class encouragement or requirement. And any Tent City neighbors with us today? And we have some community folks and uh, fa other faculty and staff, so welcome to all. I'm gonna give a really brief introduction before I turn it over to uh, the, the real guest speaker who is Ben Nick and does is the uh, Affordable Housing Policy and Advocacy, Advocacy Specialist for the Washington Low Income Housing Institute. So before uh, Ben starts to speak, I thought I would just go through a, a, a brief intro. Um, sort of two ideas that underlie today's talk. And one is that decent, stable, affordable housing is really at the core of strong, vibrant families and communities. And so we need to be supporting housing policies that acknowledge the importance of affordable rental housing. Generally, when we're talking affordable housing in this context, we're looking at housing affordable to people earning in the low income categories, 80% of area median income and, and below, 80, 50, 30 are sort of the affordable housing um, categories that we're really concerned about. And that affordable housing is is an essential platform that promotes positive outcomes for individuals, children, families related to education, employment, physical health, mental health, a whole host. Housing is really critical um, to well-being and development. That information comes from How Housing Matters, which is one of the MacArthur Foundation programs, initiatives, um, and so the first just has to do with that decent, stable, affordable housing. Everyone needs decent, stable, affordable housing. And the second notion that I'm really passionate about is that it's not enough just to be compassionate and to care. And it's important, Tenzin Jayatso, 14th Dalai Lama said, it's not enough to be compassionate, you must act. And so in that context of acting, I think both of providing service and advocating for social and economic structural change. And so at the bottom, I've done the compassion service advocacy so that we keep in mind, today's talk is gonna be about the advocacy, compo the advocacy component. So back in December, I did the educational forum related to affordable housing. And the title was, Are Cars and Tents Really Housing? Where is the affordable rental housing? Um, looking at do we or why do we uh, think it's acceptable for people to be living without anything under trees or in cars or in tents. And so a couple of notions from that talk were that homelessness is driven by poverty, low wage jobs, low wage jobs and high cost housing. And the, lack, the absolute lack of, of housing units affordable to people in the low income categories. And that the goal is for everyone to have the opportunity to live in housing, again, safe, healthy, affordable, ideally close to jobs, shopping, other services that they participate in. So what happens when people don't have that opportunity 
to live in safe, affordable housing or when it's not close to things they participate in? Well, the consequences are really quite negative, both for individuals and for communities and for society as a whole. For individuals, um, they crowd in with other people, right? Our college graduates find roommates, and we probably all know people that are couch surfing and staying here, there, and you know, trying to piece it together. Sometimes they live in substandard conditions or in housing that has physical conditions that we would consider not acceptable. Very often, if they can find a housing unit at all, um, they pay excessive amounts of their income on housing, and we consider that cost burdened. So the, the cutoff for affordable housing for people earning 8% of it, median income and below is 30% of your income going to housing and related expenses. The notion is if you pay more than that, you might not have enough resources left for food, transportation, medical, other necessities. And that's particularly critical the lower your income because you have less income to work with. So cost burdened. And one we're very familiar with in, in the Seattle area is they live far away and they commute, right? They live far away, they commute in. What happens, we've all been in it, particularly fall quarter, traffic, conge traffic congestion, pollution. Um, it takes up a lot of time. And so if you're spending that much time commuting, you have less time, right, at home with your own family, and you have less time in your own community to participate. So individual sort of family issues, but for, communi for communities and society, harder to attract and keep employment opportunities. Um, co costs for medical care, police, fire, jails, shelters, are actually greater than the cost if you actually provided housing. So in the discussion about you know, costs to do something, well, it probably costs more to do nothing to communities, to society, and, and also for individuals. So sort of just a, a review. In the fall, I like to talk about the continuum of housing because it's sort of how communities approach housing for city of Seattle, King County. <coughs> and looking at, when I talk to my students in the housing class, most of my students are most familiar with market rate rental and ownership. And not aware of, you know, homelessness prevention, subsidized housing, market rate affordable housing. So the housing continuum really just <coughs> presents the range of housing options that should be available within a community for all the citizens that want to live and work in that community. And the biggest obstacle, of course, is that the market doesn't provide the type of housing needed at a cost many can afford. And so we're looking at subsidized, subsidizing housing and we're looking at government policies and resources. So what's happened since that talk in December? Ten cities here. Ten city has moved um, onto our campus. If you read the Seattle paper any day of the week about, there's some, um, news article related to affordable housing, homelessness. And this was actually a King 5 news story, January 9th, massive affordable housing plan in Seattle being studied. And I think that Linda Brill, I think in that story, she was talking about um, a bond sale, a bond sale to pay for affordable housing. And, and that was um, her idea. And since then there was some opposition to that, and maybe we should be doing public-private partnerships. Anyway, King Five. And then within the Seattle Times, just within, when? January 12th and January 14th, rents rising quickly as older buildings change hands. Some of those buildings, I think the articles were from West Seattle, were looking at a 145% rent increase. And so you're thinking, that doesn't just affect people earning in the low incomes, that is creeping into moderate and middle income. 
And then Seattle Mayor wants to allow and regulate three new tent cities. I think within the last few days that has been approved, right? I think they voted on it. And uh, Mayor Murray, Mayor Murray, um, they're looking at proposing at, at having more tent, ci tent cities within the city of Seattle. This just represents Seattle. You know, we could broaden out to King County, to Snohomish, to the Puget Sound area, to the state of Washington, and we would be seeing similar things happening around the states relevant to like Yakima or Spokane, whatever would be unique to that geographic region and their citizens and their housing issues. And so today's talk is sort of about advocacy back in that um, King 5 News story, which was quite brief, but the council member said, you know, affordable housing, we need the political will, and the political will is only going to get generated if the public demands that elected officials do something. And I put a definition of advocacy up here just because I thought, well, I keep using that word and people know what it means. It's just, it's support or recommendation for a particular cause or policy. And so that would be policies or resources that would support affordable housing and decreasing homelessness. Citizen participation is critical. If you want to create structural or systemic changes, it's important to be educated on the issues. What are the issues related to homelessness and affordable housing? Ben will talk about some of those today. It's important to be compassionate and provide service don't stop at service while you're advocating and working for change. And when we're advocating for increased community and government involvement, you go back to the housing continuum, we want to ideally prevent homelessness. It costs less to prevent it, right, than to address it once it's in place. We need to be preserving existing housing, existing programs, existing resources, in addition to securing New, new funding, new budgets, new programs, etc. So the opportunities to advocate, and Ben will be talking about this further, is um, we have a <coughs> training beyond the one night count, February 4th, here at SPU. And so we would hope that there would be a lot of folks that are interested in doing the advocacy training. I've heard those trainers are extremely good. Um, right? Yeah, so it will be, um, I, I'm not going to do this one because I'm here today. There are going to be three down the one count, so I'm going to do the other two. Uh, but it will be my colleague, Kate Baker, who is amazing, and then um, a woman named Nancy Amade, who's from the University of Washington School of Social Work, who is, I call her the patron saint of advocacy because everyone I meet who does advocacy has at some point in their life been mentored by her or been taught by her or been fired up by her. She's incredible. She's one of the most... Um, engaging in amazing speakers, so we'll see on this topic. And then um, Ben will probably also be talking about Housing and Homelessness Advocacy Day in Olympia. Last year they had 600 people, and we're hoping to take a group of students or whoever's interested from SPU together in a group. And I'm going to um, pass around a clipboard for students that are interested, I think. Dr. Snedker and I are both going to go, and so I think that would be a fabulous all-day meet with legislators, talk about the issues sort of thing, and um, Ben will talk about that further. Ben is with the Washington Long Income Housing Alliance, and I, talk, I teach a class in housing, and so I always talk about this briefly, but I really liked your statement on justice and on community, and I thought it was particularly timely since we just celebrated Martin Luther King and social and economic justice. A just society provides everyone the opportunity to live in a safe, healthy, affordable home. It's people and organizations who care about affordable housing and ending homelessness part of a broader struggle for social justice. It sort of puts their organization in that context. And then it, it connects housing not just to how important it is for individuals, but the community. Home is the foundation that each person and family needs to succeed. But a roof overhead is just the first step, ultimately. Vision is for everyone in Washington to have a home in a thriving community, safe, healthy, affordable, inclusive. And so, on that note, I'm going to end. 
and Ben Mick Mick. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Well, while we get this worked out, um, thank you all so much for being here today. Um, it's really exciting. I, I talk about affordable housing issues everywhere I go because that's what I'm really passionate about. But over the last you know, year, the last few months, really, everyone's talking about affordable housing issues. And so it's exciting because everybody wants to talk about what I want to talk about. Um, so I, I have a bit of a cold, if you, if you can hear that. I have a microphone up here. If you can't hear me, let me know. I'll start using that. That's fine. Um, and definitely feel free as I, when we get this loaded up, as um, if you have questions about anything I'm talking about, feel free to shout them out. We can. Um, we don't have to wait till the end to to go through things. I know that there's a lot of people have, um, you know, there are a lot of things that people believe um, they, they've heard about affordable housing and about homelessness that. Um, you know, maybe aren't always, aren't always true to life. I think that you know, for many of us, when we imagine what is affordable housing, we imagine you know, the projects built in the 80s, Cabrini Green, the um, 80 floors of you know, 8,000 people um, who are all you know, deeply mired in poverty together, all out outside of a um, city, which is a really bad way to do things, which we've learned from. But I think people still have that image. Um, I know that. When I talk to people you know, my age and younger, uh, many of us believe that we've kind of always had homelessness, mass homelessness, like we, like we do now. And I think many of us don't realize that we didn't used to, uh, that we didn't. You know, you had the, the Great Depression, which is like maybe the first time the US saw kind of mass homelessness. And then after that, we had a really large uh, public housing program that housed people. And then we didn't see mass homelessness again until uh, a couple of major policy decisions in the in the 70s and um, early 80s with the Reagan administration with um, deinstitutionalization of the mental health care system and then disinvestment in public housing uh, and HUD and all of the programs that we used to build affordable housing, which was suddenly the first time that we started actually having to build shelters. Um, which I always think is fascinating because I think for many of us we feel like shelters are just a way of life, that this is just of course a problem every city has. And you know we can't keep up. We got to keep building more shelters. Um, but it didn't used to be that way. And these are all the result of public policy choices that were made by elected officials um, in response to their constituents talking to them. Um, and different decisions could be made. So my name is Ben, uh, and I work for the the Low Income Housing Alliance, as um, Sandra pointed out. Uh, so I do policy and advocacy work there. Um, before I worked for the Housing Alliance, which so I've been there for about three years. Uh, before I worked there, I've kind of worked in various uh, political jobs for the past uh, 10 years, maybe. Um, I worked for US Senator Maria Cantwell in DC on housing issues and taxes and some other things. Um, did a little bit of time, did some campaigns, uh, did a little bit of time uh, in the state legislature. Um, and so my organization, the Housing Alliance, uh, we are a statewide advocacy group. Uh, so we are a member organization. We have close to 70 or 80 member organizations, and then maybe uh, eight or nine, 10,000 maybe uh, individuals who have signed up uh, as action takers with us. Um, and we work to ensure that everyone has the opportunity to live in a safe, healthy, affordable home that's part of a thriving community. Um, and so we do that through education, and we do that through advocacy, and we do that through pu uh, public policy. And so Sandra already covered this. Um, so I will skip straight to the meat of this. Um, so has anyone in here ever heard of the, the point in time count or the one night count? Great. So these are the results from last year's one night count. And so the one night count is an attempt to try to see very, very roughly how many people are experiencing homelessness on a single night um, you know, in, in January when it's very cold. Um, kind of after the shelters are all full, after all of the housing options are, are full, um, to at least get a sense of kind of how many people are experiencing homelessness. Um, we know that it's not the most accurate thing in the world because you know many people don't get counted and don't want to get counted, but at least it's, it's inaccurate the same way every year so that we can at least, uh, it's probably off by about the same amount, so we can still kind of get a sense of whether um, more people are experiencing homelessness or less. Um, 
And I should add actually that tonight, um, well, I guess technically tomorrow morning is going to be the, the King County one night count. Um, if, if any of you are volunteering, I, I'm going to be down counting in Burien where I grew up. Um, if you haven't done it, it's a little late to get involved this year, but next year it's a really, really amazing opportunity to, um, to see your community in a very different light, uh, to see kind of where you have neighbors that you didn't realize that you did um, and kind of what they're experiencing. So what we, what we counted last year in, in King County um, was 9,294 people um, who we would count as, as homeless. Um, and of those, 3,123 um, were actually outdoors on the streets. Uh, so they were outdoors after the shelters were full, uh, after you know, the transitional housing programs were, were all full, there were you know, no spaces left. Now we still had 3,123 people um, that we were able to count in January, cold night in January, um, still living on the street uh, in King County. About a thousand. I have that later. Um, I want to say it's like 1.8 million or around there. Um, so on one hand, that's a lot of people. Um, like no, no one should have to experience homelessness. It's, it's awful. Um, on the other hand, it's also not that many people, if you think about it. That if this were a different type of disaster where we felt differently about those people, then I think that we would house them pretty quickly. If this was Hurricane Katrina and we said that we had 3,100 people outdoors, well, Hurricane Katrina may be actually a bad example, but I mean, um, uh, if, if it was a really bad earthquake, if the, you know, um, when Seattle has our mega thrust fault earthquake, uh, we have this many people outdoors, that we would see a very different response, that it's not, it's not impossible to house people. Um, we just haven't chosen to. We haven't chosen public policies that will. Um, I have a quote in here on the side just um, from Rex Holbin, who's the executive director of what had been called uh, Homeless in Seattle. It's now called Facing Homelessness. Um, I just, I appreciate that. Um, I, I won't read it. I'll try not to I have a couple of good quotes in here. I'll try not to read them all to you. But um, to remember that these are real people, that we, we talk about numbers and statistics, but that, um, you know, sometimes I hear that. People choose to be homeless because it's easy and it's better than working and you get housing assistance, but it's, it's very hard and it's very scary and it's very dangerous. Um, and we actually, you know, the one, the one fact that really blew my mind when I first got into this work was when I heard the number of people who had died uh, of exposure or violence um, or other medical conditions from being on the street in, in Seattle. Because I, at that time, had no idea that that kind of thing would happen in my city. That, like, you know, I mean, I get it, people, you know, are in tough situations and maybe they're, you know, in their car, but the idea that people who are vulnerable enough to be, to, to die from exposure, from cold weather, the idea that we don't even have enough support to help them really, really impacted me. Um, so I thought, because we're, we're here to talk about Tent City, I'd talk a little bit about where Tent City falls into this. Um, and so I have a, a little bit of a, um, of a, editorial that was in uh, yesterday's Real Change. Um, just to point out that, so we have about 300 uh, people uh, living in the, the various uh, official tent city encampments that we have, um, which is less than 10% of the people who are counted as outside. Um, legal encampments legitimize the survival struggles of homeless people uh, themselves and reduce the harm of unmet need. Um, they involve an uncomfortable admission that, uh, just that our efforts ha uh, thus far have fallen short and that we have an obligation uh, to meet the needs of the most poor, even if the means currently available fall short of the ideal. Um, tent cities and encampments are not hugely popular. Um, that you, with federal policy incentive, uh, the federal government and you know, federal policy HUD, it does not recommend that we do what the, our city is looking at, um, which is kind of endorse and actually back, um, back encampments. Because the idea is that people, people deserve more, and they do. People, everyone deserves a home. Um, everyone should have the opportunity to live in a home. But the, the very interesting part of the discussions about the 10 cities is that it is an admission that we are not providing those homes, we're not going to in the near future. How can we make sure that people are safe tonight? Um, 
And so he finishes, it's Tim, Tim Harris, uh, who is the uh, ED of Real Change, executive director, uh, who says, you know, there are means to, towards an end, and courageously place the shame of such misery amid such wealth out there for everyone to see. The public declaration that there is much, much more to be done. And so this is a picture, um, if, if folks recognize, this is the AF in the university district. This is a, a few months ago. Uh, this was a protest encampment. Um, because often the way that cities in our city has responded to uh, encampments is with these. It's a uh, notice to order and remove. Um, we don't care where you go, but you can't stay here. And so oftentimes we, public policy, we, we pay public employees to just move people around and often take all their stuff um, and throw it away. Uh, and so a number of uh, people who had been living in Ravenna Park and in some of the other parks near the university district were tired of being evicted and they made a very public protest um, by setting up an encampment right in the middle of the Ave, um, right as the new school year started. And it was, while I think amazingly powerful, it was also a really tragic statement uh, of where things are that um, you can't see her in this picture, but there was a woman living there with her. She had two young, young children. Um, I want to say one was 16 months and the other was three or something along those lines. It's in the, it's in the news article. And they're living in downtown Seattle, in, in plain view, with no running water, with no electricity, um, no heat. And this is, I think we ask ourselves, you know, is this the society that, that we want to have for ourselves? And is this the community that we want to build? And so I just, to point this out, so this, is, uh, this was the um, press conference last week with the uh, mayor pointing out, uh, with the mayor kind of changing position uh, in a way and saying that he was going to start backing um, some legal authorization of, of tent cities and encampments, including the three new ones. Um, and I'm not, Sandra had mentioned that they passed the law. I actually been so involved in the state legislature right now, I haven't read if they've voted on that or not. So they may have, they may not have. Um, but they are supposed to be voting on that very soon. And I think this is one of the important parts of, from his press release is he says that the dramatic erosion of state and federal investments to respond to their challenges have created a full-blown crisis. So back during the mayoral debate, when um, Mayor Ed Murray was running against former mayor um, Mike McGinn, uh, they had a candidate debate, actually the Real Change Breakfast. Um, and one of the things that McGinn said as like one of his points for why people should support him is he said, under my leadership, the city of Seattle is now putting more money into homelessness prevention and housing than the federal government is in our city. Which on one hand, like, Kudos to him, like that's, actually, that's, a, that's a great thing that the city is responding to the need. On the other hand, that's a very, very sad statement about where our federal priorities lie and about some of the larger political concerns that result in people ending up to experiencing homelessness. Um, which gets us back to, why are people homeless? Why do people experience homelessness? I really, I like this quote from the National Alliance on Homelessness. Um, specific reasons vary, but research shows that people are homeless because they can't find housing they can afford. Uh, so if you needed to, to research that. Um, I mean, it's a bit simple, but it's, but it's true that the, the major cause of homelessness uh, is people there's, don't have housing, um, which leads to the you know, often said statement that the, the solution to homelessness is housing. Um, so to talk a little bit about why that is, uh, this is so Washington State Department of Commerce runs our housing programs. Uh, they just released this affordable housing needs study, uh, which looked at the entire state for kind of how the market is doing, um, how people are cost burdened, and um, how much affordable housing there is. And what you see is that there is a tremendous gap. Oh, um, 1.94 million people uh, in King County, you would ask, right? Uh, and 777. Um, that in King County, uh, if you make between zero and 30% of the area median income, the area median income for a family of four is 88,000, um, there are about 15 units that are affordable and available to you. Uh, so that means there are 15 units that you can afford and that somebody else who is making more than you isn't already living in. Uh, if you're making up to half, making up to $44,000 for a family of four, which is not a lot of money in Seattle, uh, 34 units. Um, and so 
they have a forecast here for what, you know, by 2019, um, and as you can see, it actually it barely changes and gets slightly worse. Um, that over the next couple of years, we just see continued erosion of affordability as the market continues to build new units really aimed at the, at the high end of um, very high rents, very high price point. Um, and so just looking at the, what this results in is cost burden. Um, and so cost burden, we have, we have two forms, two measures of cost burden. We have cost burden and then what's called severely cost burden. And it goes back to what's known as the Brook Rule, which is that a person or family should pay about 30% of their income for housing. Um, back in about 1960, I'll actually show this on another slide, uh, about one in every four Americans was cost burden. They were paying more than 30%. Uh, today, it's close to one in every four is severely cost burden. They're paying more than half of their income just on housing costs alone. And so in, in King County, um, for if you're making between zero and 30% of the area median income, we have almost 60,000 families, or 60,000 households in that category. The vast majority of them are putting their first paycheck and part of their second paycheck into housing and utilities. Um, 30 to 50, 40,000 people, 25,000-ish of them paying more than 30%, paying, more than 30%, paying an un, a too large share of their income just on housing costs. And then another um, 15,000 severely cost burdened. And so there's also, um, for homeowner households, um, who are also many are in a similar situation. And so this is, this is national. This is um, from Harvard's Joint Center on Housing Studies. Uh, they do this every year, America's Rental Housing, it's a report. And what you see is that since, you know, they started tracking this in 86, rents are going up and wages are going down. Uh, I mean, it's, it's probably something that we're all very familiar with, but I like to actually show the numbers. Um, and so, so what that results in is that we have more and more people living on the edge. Uh, that, you know, a lot of times in conversations about homelessness, uh, we often talk about personal responsibility. But I, I, I like to, I mean, I don't know, I, I often have terrible metaphors. I um, was trying this one out this morning. Let me know what you think. It's kind of like if instead of having crosswalks, we had tight ropes over the road. And then when people fell off, we're like, well, maybe they should have spent more time. Um, are you showing me a note? Are you? Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> uh, uh, and when they fell off, we said, well, they should have spent more time practicing Tai Chi and taking a little bit more personal responsibility over their balance. Um, because personal choices matter, but the larger picture is that we have way, way more people who are really, really close, who are living on the edge, who are one missed paycheck away from losing, you know, losing their housing. Um, who are one medical bill away, who are one accident, who's one car breakdown away from not being able to make it to work, um, that can push people over the edge. Because there's just not that, when people are already paying, I, I live for a while, um, through a bad choice of my own, I live for a while paying like 65% of my income towards rent. And one bad choice, like I, I, couldn't, I wouldn't be able to recover from it. Um, and, Accidents happen. You don't have that margin there to that cushion. And so, what we hope is that when people are on the edge, if people fall into homelessness, that there is going to be services and housing available to help them. Because we know that housing is really important. We know that housing is the foundation to education results, um, educational attainment. You know, in Washington State, we just had the newest numbers on the number of school children uh, who are counted by the, the K-12 system as experiencing homelessness. Um, and I didn't memorize it. Last year was 30,000. It's up, I want to say 32,000. Um, and it's, we, we, you know, this is a different debate, but we can put all the money we want into to teachers and books, and we should because they're extremely important. But if we do that and we don't pay attention to the housing needs of those students, you know, you can only do even the best school in the world from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. isn't going to really help students succeed and be a foundation for success if from 3 p.m. to 9 a.m. you know they're doing homework in the back of a van. Um, which, so what this is, um, I, I, this is from a group down in California called RAP. Um, and this is the federal, this is a single graph of the federal disinvestment in housing programs. Uh, that after, you know, 
in the 60s and 70s that the federal government put a lot of money into helping people be housed. And it worked. Um, but since then, we have drastically, drastically cut that money away from HUD and uh, from other housing programs. And so if any of you watch, you know, if, if you pay attention to what's going on in DC and federal, federal politics, um, what, we're, what we're arguing about, and so this, this stops at 2003, and in case you think maybe, oh, things have changed in the past uh, you know, 12 years, um, this, is a, this is a more up-to-date graph, it just doesn't have the, the artwork. Um, but what we're, what we're arguing about is you know, differences in five, eight percent cuts in this, which are huge and dramatic to people who are being helped. But at the end of the day, roughly one of every four people who's eligible for housing assistance in this country receives housing assistance. Uh, which means three out of every four people who need it don't get it. Because housing assistance is not an entitlement. It's not like Medicaid, it is not like Social Security uh, disability, um, which have their own issues to access, but housing assistance is there's a limited amount and the number of people who can get it are the ones who do, and everybody else, good luck. Um, so another, to finish this quote from Rex, and this is from a, a TEDx talk he did, which is great, and you should look it up on YouTube and watch it. Um, he says, what do we do with, with all of the information we are constantly hearing about homelessness? Do we take it in? Does it touch us? Most importantly, does it motivate us to get involved in some way? And so that's really what, what I'm here to talk about, um, which is the power of public policy and advocacy in shaping these decisions. Because these are public policy choices that were made. That the, you know, um, right now there is a, a school of thought uh, that maybe you have seen or heard from a friend that says that the reason housing is so expensive is because we have all these building regulations. We just need to get rid of all the building codes because that'll lower the cost of um, production and then you'll have more, demand, more supply to meet the demand and everybody will be happy. Haven't you studied economics? Um, I'll say two things to that. One is, we have examples in the world of places that have no building codes or regulations, and it is true that they do provide housing for just about all of their citizens. Um, places like the, if you, I don't have a picture over here, but like the slums of Mumbai um, is an example. That there are, <laughs> there uh, are trade-offs that we, we pick, that we wanna have a city that works for us, that has roads that uh, can get people to places, that has healthcare, that has access to jobs and opportunity. Um, that has infrastructure like not burning down or falling down and uh, plumbing uh, and running water. Uh, and so that these things are important choices that we make. And that theoretically, I guess, in a very, very abstract sense, they raise the cost of housing, um, which is why we need public policy to come in and help lower the price of housing for some people so that they can stay a part of our community. Because if we don't, then we end up with a community where lots of people can't afford to live there. And that's bad for them and it's bad for us. Uh, it's bad for the people who, um, like Sandra was saying, have to commute in very, very long distances to a job. I mean, then they're on the roads and they're polluting. And there's health concerns being stuck in traffic because it's terrible and stressful and I hate it. Um, but also that I want a community that my parents can afford to live in too. That children who don't have economic opportunities now can live here and get economic opportunities when they get older. And so my organization focuses mostly on state advocacy. We do some federal advocacy, um, a little bit of local advocacy, but I'm gonna talk mostly about stuff we're doing at the state level. Um, one last quote I'll read, and I have no idea who said this. If anybody's ever heard this before and you know who did, I'm, I'm trying to find out. But the phrase persistent poverty implies that poverty persists despite society's best attempts to end it. The truth is the opposite that our current economic and political system produces poverty again and again, despite the best efforts of individuals and families to escape it. And I think that's a really uh, important point as we talk about some of the ways that policy choices make um, keep, people, keep people homeless, um, which is not something that we would think that they do, but they do. Um, so I'm gonna go through, we have a number of one-pagers in the back, um, which are our we have a, a lead agenda, uh, so we go down to Olympia State Capitol, and we're focusing on a number of policy pieces. Um, so we have all of our one-pagers there. Far too many, but there's so many important things to do. I'm gonna talk about uh, four of our main issues. Um, four solutions 
to help people, uh, to help less people experience homelessness and to make sure that more people are safe, have that opportunity to live in a safe, healthy, affordable home. The first one is to build affordable housing. Um, Washington State is, is unique. Um, we were one of the first states in the country to build what's known as a housing trust fund. And it's a state investment, it's a state capital investment in building affordable housing. Um, we did that in 1987, and we first put money into it in 1989. Uh, trust fund is a bit of a misnomer. It's an annual capital appropriation, which means that it starts at zero. It's not like it's always there. And so every single year, advocates go down to Olympia, and we have to explain that there are lots of important things that the budget should fund, but housing for our communities is one of them. And that you can't fund education and not housing and think that you're going to get good results. Or you can't fund healthcare and not housing and think that you're going to get health results. Um, we've built, with the, with the trust fund, um, which leverages a lot of other local and federal funding sources, we've built 37-ish thousand uh, units in Washington State, um, which is amazing, and that's a lot. Um, but we still, as you saw earlier, have a ways to go. Uh, and this is, just as an example, um, not all of it looks like this. A lot of it's, there's single family homes, there's, um, you know, very small units, but this is, just because this is up the street, um, this is the Nair Ernest house, and I think that um, Compass was the one who came in at your last, so Compass Housing Alliance built the Nair Ernest house, which um, is actually named after the father of one of my coworkers, uh, who had been a housing advocate for a long time. And so this is, these are the kinds of things that the Housing Trust Fund built. Um, this in particular is a supportive housing project. It's for people who are very, very vulnerable. And it, it isn't just housing, it pairs housing with supportive services to help people stay in housing and help people stay connected to uh, health, health um, providers in the medical system to make sure that their lives are, are better, that they can stay there. Um, we can do more of that, but we have to go fight for it. And uh, I, I don't think we have time, but I do have some slides on what's going on with the state budget. Um, if anybody's interested, I can get into that. It's a, there's a, it's a tough fight. There's a lot that we have. It's going to take a lot of advocacy. If folks aren't there asking for this, it's not going to happen. Um, so there's a, this is our one pager on this, um, on our solution of uh, having the state invest in building affordable housing. Um, and so if any of you end up coming to Housing and Homelessness Advocacy Day with us, this is one of the main things that we talk about. And so we provide talking points to advocates and we set up meetings with legislators. And so then you can go in and you can tell your legislator, I believe that everybody in my community should be able to afford to live there. Um, and I want you to, in this case, invest $100 million in um, affordable housing through the capital budget to help make that happen. Um, and again, if, if folks have questions about the specific policies, feel free to, to shout them out. Um, yeah? Is that funded like, through a little charge on uh, when houses are sold? What do they like to No. So that's, um, so, we're, and we're not, so, uh, so in addition to the housing trust fund, Washington State also has um, what's known as the, we call it doc fees, document recording fees. It's technically the homeless housing and assistance surcharge, which is a very, very small fee that's added on to primarily real estate transactions. So if you buy a $500,000 house um, and you're paying your like $5,000 in closing costs, um, we add on $48 and that money um, is the largest, that money gets pooled together and it becomes the largest source of, of funding for uh, homeless housing and services in every county in our state. And so we end up pairing it with the trust fund. And so what we end up often doing is like at a, I, I assume this is how Naira Ernest House does it. I'm not, I, I should probably actually check, but um, the housing trust fund helped build the building. And then the document recording fees actually help pay for some of those services that people need. They pay for a case manager to pair together. Oh, it's, we call it like a three-legged stool of building affordable housing. You have the, the capital investment, the bricks and mortar. Uh, you have the services that if for, to, uh, for vulnerable populations, you, you often need case managers and other services to help people stay in housing. And then you have um, like the operations costs, which are roofs and uh, heating bills and everything that you know, we don't think about when we just like, hey, we, we built you affordable housing. Like, but um, it takes money to, to maintain that and keep it going. Um, anyway, I just wanted to quickly show, you know, Washington State, while we've been better than the federal government, the big trend, we're, we're facing some of the similar, the similar trend uh, over the last few years of 
declining investments in affordable housing. Um, really, as at the state and federal budget, as our budget shrinks, um, we just have less government than we used to. Uh, we have less taxes, mostly on very, very wealthy people. That's also another issue um, I want to talk about today. But this is, this is kind of the result. So this are, these are state investments in the trust fund since we, we created it or first funded in 89. And as you can see, we had a high point back when the market was great uh, in 2009. But since then, it's, it's been kind of a steadily downward trajectory. Uh, last year was the first year that we had nothing uh, in it since 89, um, which to be fair, the state legislature didn't pass a capital budget at all. Um, so it was a bad for us and bad for, for lots of reasons. Um, we're, we're really hopeful that we will be able to, to get an investment again. Um, but even though you can see, you know, 100 million is still less than we got since 2003. And I don't know if you've looked around, and um, if you rent it, it's very, ex very expensive housing market right now. It's expensive to build. Um, so that's kind of kind of where things are. That's one of the reasons advocacy again is so important. Um, I also want to point out that affordability isn't the only challenge. Um, I can't see my notes, so I, I cannot remember off the top of my head the name of the artist who put this together. Uh, but this is a a revision of a very famous Norman Rockwell painting of a young African American girl being escorted by um, by the what, uh, state national guard. Um, to the first desegregated school after Brown versus Board of Education, uh, the Supreme Court decision uh, in New Orleans, uh, to talk about you know this they, it's the um, the problem we live with, I think is the exact name, um, and just as a reminder that it's not just housing that there are a lot of uh, both policy choices and personal beliefs that people have uh, that result in um, in stigmas and in bias and in prejudice um, that. Are, can be real significant barriers to getting people into housing. And so we're working on three bills um, this year to help address a couple different pieces of those. Um, they're focused on tenant legislation. Um, we're really primarily interested in them because I think that it's kind of the part of like our interest in making sure that nobody is homeless. But the truth is that these are actually things that affect everybody um, across income. So the first is, it's called the Truth and Evictions Reporting Act. Uh, so right now in Washington State, we have a very interesting system where if somebody files an eviction against you and they go, they go to the court and they say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to evict this person, and that they, the court creates a record in what's called SCOMIS, which is like their document tracking system. That stuff's all publicly accessible. In fact, they sell it. And what happens is when you go to apply to another apartment, uh, I'm assuming, that, are many of you renters? Have you all paid uh, for uh, tenant screening reports? So what they do when they run those is to check if you've had an eviction. They just check if your name matches a case file of whether an eviction has been filed. Well, what that means is all this like court stuff doesn't matter. If your landlord sued you for eviction for bad reasons and you went to court and you won or it got thrown out, it doesn't matter. You still have an eviction on your record. Heck, if you were the wrong, if you were wrongly named, if I'm John Smith, and they meant a different John Smith. You still have an eviction on your record, and you can't. And it's going to be very, very difficult and much more expensive to get into housing because of that. Um, we've been trying to fix this for a couple years. Um, it's modeled actually after similar legislation we worked on, where you also used to be able to discriminate against survivors of domestic violence. That if somebody had a court order for protection of um, sexual assault or harassment or DV. Um, on their tenant screening report, landlords could say, well, we don't, want, we don't want that trouble. We won't rent to them. Um, and so similar to that, we're trying to say that landlords can't, that's not valid grounds to deny tenancy to an applicant. Um, and also that landlords shouldn't be able to see that information to be biased against them. Um, so we're working on that this year. Um, I'm actually going to do SOID next. I'm going to do Fair Tenant Screening Act. This is another, another piece that we've been working on for several years, um, which is the high cost of those tenant screening reports. Uh, I recently applied for an apartment. Uh, my girlfriend and I, we paid $103, I think, to apply to an apartment for the screening fees for both of us. The next day, they told us we were denied because we had dogs, even though the Craigslist ad said they allowed dogs, because they, they thought another family that didn't have dogs would have less wear and tear. 
And then they were just going to keep that money. What happens right now is even though tenant screening reports are, are mostly the same, it's your eviction history, which is bad, and your credit score, and then you know a couple other checks, um, the criminal record, that kind of thing. Even though uh, they're mostly the same, you have to buy a new one every single time you apply to a different apartment. I mean, can you imagine, I don't know, having to pay for a new background check at every job you applied to? Uh, that's not how it works. Like, you should be able to have that information and give it to a landlord and say, like, listen, this is, this is current. I already paid for this. It's already been looked up. You shouldn't be allowed to charge me again just to apply. Um, and so that's, that's what we're working on doing. There's a company uh, in Vancouver called MoCo that actually has like a portable. It's an online report. You log in. It's like secure and encrypted. You, it's not just something that somebody prints out, um, which we think is a pretty easy fix. But it's, it's tough because there's a lot of people who make a lot of money off of selling many, many of these to the same person. Um, in terms of the direct connection to homelessness, though, so I, we, I work with an advocate named Thomas who just testified in Olympia on this recently. And Thomas was in a shelter. And Thomas got, um, he was a veteran, um, you know, had some experience with, with addiction issues, uh, overcame them, was in a shelter, got housing assistance, was ready, um, was ready to move into an apartment. But he could only afford three tenant screenings a month. And you know, he had some issues on his, uh, in his history. And so he would tell a landlord, hey, when you run the report, here's what you're going to find. They would be like, listen, we're going to overlook it. And they'd go, oh, we found what you said. We're going to deny you. And so he would apply to three. And then he would wait till next month and save up another $110, $120, apply to three, get denied, and wait. He ended up spending three extra months in shelter, um, taxpayer-funded shelter, uh, and more importantly, taking the bed of somebody who, who, one of the 3,123 people we talked about earlier, who isn't able to get in shelter because they're full, because he couldn't get into housing because he just couldn't apply to enough places. It's, I mean, there was a landlord out there who wanted him. Uh, there was, you know, it was just a matter of, being able to connect them. Um, and so it's just it's kind of a ridiculous barrier, I think. The last one is um, source of income discrimination protection. So right now, it is also legal to discriminate, uh, to say that you will not rent to someone because they are paying with a housing choice voucher of any kind. Uh, actually, Thomas, in that same story, uh, part of his income was primarily from um, disability benefits uh, from the VA, because he was a veteran and he was injured in a Black Hawk helicopter accident. And even though I guess his, his money just wasn't green enough, the landlords were saying that they wouldn't accept his disability benefits as income because it wasn't, they wanted to see someone with a job instead. And so it kept him out of housing. Um, and so what we're, we're trying to say is that you shouldn't be able to, to deny someone housing just because part of their income is not traditional income from a, a wage, uh, from a job. They can't, if they can't afford the apartment or they don't meet your screening criteria, you know, that's, that's, we're not changing that. Um, the biggest issue with this is that like many issues in housing, it's deeply, deeply intertwined with other, with other issues related to, to class and to race uh, particularly, and that this is often a proxy for other kinds of discrimination. That we pass a law that says you can't discriminate against someone because they're a person of color, but you can discriminate against them because they have a housing choice voucher. And if um, you know, many of our voucher holders are people of color. And so you can, many people say, oh, I'm, the reason I'm not renting to you is because of your voucher, and that's OK. Um, and so it ends up in you know, all of these kind of individual choices um, lead together to big community-wide outcomes. What happens is you end up with only certain communities where people can live people of color or people who are low income or where people take vouchers. And we end up segregating our society and our communities. Um, it's actually it's fascinating. Again, we don't have a lot of time, but the history of how our communities were built um, and the policy choices that resulted in Asian people only being able to buy a property in the international district, and that's the reason we have an international district in Seattle, uh, is fascinating. Um, I have till 1210 or 1220? 1220. All right. So, how to get involved. Um, this is my dog, Berkeley. I have two dogs. Lady didn't get to be pictured because she was barking at me when, she, when I was working on this. <laughs> and I was hoping that would teach her a lesson and maybe she would stop barking because she wants to be in the PowerPoint next time. Um, the reason I picture my dog, Berkeley, is how many of you are, are pet owners? And how many of you are veterinarians? A lot of people often, bear with me, <laughs> a lot of people often are worried about engaging in the public policy process because they're not policy experts. 
because they, they don't want to go to a legislator and say, fund affordable housing, the legislator says, oh, well, do you think the, the cap on the 4% tax credit bond allocation that's remaining isn't, isn't good enough or, or something? And they, they won't have to say. But advocacy is a lot like owning a pet. You don't have to be an expert. You call in an expert when you need them. That's, that's what I do. That's my job. I, I come in and I respond to those dumb questions. What's important is telling legislators and telling people who are decision makers that you care. Uh, it's telling them that I don't know the details, but I know that I want a community that everybody can live in and that they can afford to live in and that people aren't living on the edge, precariously hanging on the balance of homelessness. Um, I think that's one of the main, main concerns I hear for people who haven't engaged in public policy advocacy before. Um, but if, if there are others, please, I mean, if, if you haven't called your legislator before and you have a reason, let's hear it. I can, I can talk about it. Um, so other ways to get involved. This is, this is the Housing Alliance's website. Um, there are lots of advocacy organizations depending on what issues you care, you care about. If this is the issue that drives you, and um, by all means, like, go to our website, sign up for our email list. Um, especially during the state legislative session, we will send you action alerts that are really easy ways to take action. Um, and we will connect you to lots and lots of opportunities um, to really have your voice be part of the process and make a difference. Um, and there are other advocacy organizations as well. Um, and by all means, like, you should be involved. People, people need to be involved. I think sometimes we, we think, oh, the political system doesn't work like we want it to, so I'm just going to, frankly, make the problem worse by not participating in it. I think we need to do the opposite. We need to be much more engaged to make it work better for us. Um, our website is chock full of resources. Uh, we've got all of our one-pagers for download, talking points, webinars cover exploring each of our policy issues, a blog where we give like regular updates. Um, there, there's not a lot of reporting left in Olympia. Uh, disinvestments in uh, actual reporting services um, mean that it's hard to actually know what's going on in our state legislature. And so I've actually found that weirdly we're one of the best news sources on housing issues that maybe aren't being covered by t TVW's limited budget or by the couple reporters who are down there. Um, you should all figure out who represents you. Uh, you should all be registered to vote. Let's, let's start there. If you aren't, talk to me. I'll, I'll get you registered. Um, and if you are, you should know who represents you. Um, many of us around here probably live in the 36th um, or the 43rd, uh, depending. But if you go to the legislature's website, we have one of the best legislative websites in the country. Um, some of the others are very sad. They're written like a H anyway. Um, you plug in your address and it pops up who your local representative is and who your state senator is and who your uh, congressional representative is in your U.S. Senate. Well, every, all of our U.S. senators are Marie Campbell, Patty Murray. But you should know that because then you can know who they are if you see them in the neighborhood and you can talk to them uh, and you can tell them what you care about. Um, Sandra was saying attending Housing and Homelessness Advocacy Day is a great, great opportunity, especially if you haven't done much advocacy before. It's really fun and it's really easy. Um, you go, there's a ton of energy, everybody's there together, we're all wearing red scarves. Um, the Housing Alliance organization, we give some training and we have like some motivational like, speakers come um, and we, we talk about like what's going on in Olympia, who's doing what, and what you should talk about. We've already set up your meetings with your legislators for you and you just you go get connected with a legislative district lead who like takes you over there and then you just go talk to your legislator about why you care about housing. Um, again, we're not the only um, advocacy day in town. We're one of the biggest, um, but come to ours and find the ones you know, more than anything, find the issues that you're passionate about and, and participate in them, um, I think is a more important message. The last, last thing I'll finish, well, two more slides. One is that advocacy works. Um, the other thing, in addition to people not being experts, is that people think, why should I get involved? Why should I waste my time? As an individual citizen, I don't have a lot of power over the system. Um, and there's sometimes in places where that's true, but for the, for the vast majority, advocacy really does work. And so this was a story, this was from uh, last year. Uh, we're actually working on the um, document recording fees legislation that Nancy, uh, um, that Nikki mentioned. Um, we, we have that funding, but it was set to sunset because you, we were only able to get it through temporarily. And so we were fighting, we we're gonna lose this funding, it was gonna be closing, it would, it would mean closing down um, shelters, domestic violence centers, um, you know, more people on the street. People, I mean, really, really terrible, terrible outcomes. Um, and what ended up happening is this is a woman named Senator Jan Angel, 
and Senator Angel was opposed to our legislation and she was the chair of the committee. And at the very, very last possible minute, she gaveled the committee shut without allowing our bill to be voted out. Even though we had people, we had bipartisan, bicameral support, we had everybody there ready to vote for it. Um, she prevented it. And by, by everything you've ever seen, how a bill becomes a law, the schoolhouse rock stuff, our bill was dead. There was, nowhere, there was no other way for the bill to move forward. Committee, committee cutoff was passed. Um, there, there were no other living vehicles, what that's called, of, of bills that you could put it into. Our bill was dead. But the real power in, in any of this is, is people and it's advocacy. There was a statewide out, outcry. Um, we had, I think, 50 op-eds that went out in all the papers. Even the Seattle Times, which editorial board I don't always love, wrote um, this. They wrote that the homeless are victims of legislative malpractice. And what ended up happening is that even though our bill was dead, um, Senate leadership figured out that they were not going to be able to go home and not pass that bill. Um, and so actually Senator Angel ended up being the one to uh, introduce the amendment to the bill, ended up being the bill that passed. And even though she was the one who gaveled it shut, that she heard from so many people yelling at their legislators that this was too important to miss, that everybody changed their tune. And it was the second to last bill, I think, passed, um, passed by the legislature that year. Um, so advocacy does work. Um, we, we can make a difference through our involvement. The last thing, um, there's one last quote, I, I will read it to you. This is uh, from a man named Andy Silver. He runs the uh, Clark County Council for the Homeless. And this is from their, um, a breakfast they just had a few months ago. He said that we know how, no matter what a person's challenges are, we know how to get them back into housing and help them thrive. And we didn't talk about that a ton today, but we, we have a whole set of responses to help like, progressive engagement, to help people meet, meet them where they're at, provide different services depending on what they need, um, to really get people effectively housed and stably stay there. And he said, when we walk to our office and we walk by the man sleeping in the park, we have to think that he's different. We have to think he's choosing to be there, that he did something wrong or he deserves it. Because if we don't think that, then all we have is that we live in a community that has the solutions, but we haven't prioritized them. Now we know how to help him get off that, uh, that park bench. We, um, we know how to get those families out of their cars, but we're prioritizing other things. Um, and I think that's true. So that's, hope that was helpful. Um, we have a couple minutes left for if, if folks have questions or, or comments, I'd love to hear what you're all thinking. Thank you. I know many of you attended because your class is required to. I hope this wasn't, hope you still got something out of it. Um, no questions at all? Where is the clipboard that was being passed around? Yeah. I well, I recently watched a video about Salt Lake City, Utah, mm -hmm. doing some advocacy for their homeless and it, it was working. Do you know anything about that? Like, I, I, it was just like it was an upward video and I thought it was really cool. Yeah, so, yeah. Um, so Salt Lake City, and they're, yeah, they were on the Daily Show recently too. Um, they're the, the first uh, city in the country to end uh, chronic homelessness among, we, so we have kind of a couple different categories of people who experience, of how we help kind of figure out people who are experiencing homelessness. And so chronic homelessness is people who are repeatedly homeless or homeless for very, very long periods of time. And they're, um, amazing innovative solution to chronic homelessness was housing. Um, and so it's, in particular, it's expansion of a model called permanent supportive housing, uh, which is something that we're working on. I didn't, we have two other priorities that I didn't talk about, but one of them is we're trying to amend the state's Medicaid plan to help fund those kinds of projects to take them to scale, because we have a number of people um, who could be helped by that if we could afford to build it. Um, and so I think that's, it, it is, it's really, it's exciting and amazing um, that they were able to do that. They still have, I mean, their, their, housing situ their housing troubles are not gone. Uh, there's still a lot of people living on the edge. There's still the economic issues of unaffordable housing that needs to be addressed through investments in affordable housing. Um, but yeah, I mean, like I said earlier, 3,100 3, people on the street is a lot, and it's unconscionable when you think about the, the human misery attached to that. But from a practical perspective, it's not that many people that we could put 
them into housing. If we could almost build a 100-foot tunnel under the city, I'm sure that we could figure out a way to, um, <laughs> yeah. another bad example. Uh, but I mean, like, we, we, we are able to do amazing things, and I think that it's, it's, to, it's totally within our grasp that if, if folks advocate to the legislature for, legislature for solutions, that we could do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, also, about like, the placement of these affordable housing, are they, are they and is this still working on interspersing them between other market value houses, or would it be concentrated in like one area where all of those houses would be kind of segregated in the city? This is a big debate. Um, many people often say, like, let's just build the cheapest housing we can. It's way cheaper to build it where nobody wants to live. Um, so let's just build housing for everybody, and then the problem is solved. Um, but as everybody who lives in a house knows, location matters. I mean, location, location, location. And that what ends up happening when you segregate um, affordable housing communities off by themselves, um, we pair that with an education system that's funded through local property taxes, which means that you're born there and you're born into poverty and where everyone is also in poverty. You go to a school that isn't funded. There's, you're probably you're probably not connected by light rail or anything else to, to jobs or opportunity. And so chances are very good that you are also going to need housing assistance. And so are your children. And you, you create intergenerational poverty. Um, and so like, we really, we, it's sometimes hard for us to make this argument to people that we want to build very expensive affordable housing in very, very desirable locations. But you have to, because that's how we need people to be part of our community, not, I mean, not off like, stuck somewhere out of the way. Um, this is particularly important in, in Seattle right now. Um, and it's, it's a little after 1222. People have to go. Um, I'm available by email or phone. Um, Seattle is changing. I mean, you all know this, but it is changing so much. And it is going to continue changing so much. Uh, there's a group called Puget Sound Regional Council. They have some estimates that we're going to bring in another 1.8 million people into King, Pierce, Kitsap, and Snohomish by 2040 which is so many people uh, who are all going to be wanting housing and who are all going to be competing for the apartments that we have. On top of that, we've approved $20 billion investment in light rail through Sound Transit. What that means is that the property around that light rail is really, really valuable already. I mean, Othello Station saw like 500% property value increases already. And in 10 years, it's going to be you know, like Manhattan. If we don't buy that now, if we don't get land there now for affordable housing, what are the odds that we're going to be able to do it later? I mean, there's not going to, even if, there's, even if there is developable property left, which is maybe, it's going to be way, way beyond the reach of affordable housing developers. And so um, I think there's really, it's important to think about that because we got we to gotta act now um, to make sure that people get to stay in our community. Um, I wonder what is the next push towards affordable housing within new development. So, you know, pushing the legislation to say, okay, if you want to build this expensive housing in, say, Ballard, X percent has to be affordable housing and it's defined in these terms. Rather than just, it's important to also have affordable yeah. housing units by nonprofits and other organizations, but how do we really change that in, in, in a business sense? Yep. And there are a couple efforts to do things like that. Um, the Housing Development of Consortium of Seattle King County is a partner of ours is really leading the local efforts on inclusionary zoning and linkage fees, and primarily linkage fees at this point. Um, and linkage fees is that debate. Uh, linkage fees is how you give developers a discount and say, you know, either build units that are affordable in your building or um, put money into building affordable units in the same neighborhood. Um, you know, one of the things we saw with like the South Lake Union developments is that there's a lot of interest in like, we'll give you as much money as you want to build affordable housing way far away. Um, but we want people in those communities. And so I agree it needs to be linked. Um, there's also some federal tax, the low income housing tax credit. Uh, it's our primary driver of, of multifamily housing. And it um, results in a lot of mixed use um, projects where some, some units are affordable and some aren't. And um, I think that's great. I think people should all be able to live together. Um, but look into linkage fees, and it's another place where citizen advocacy will make a huge difference. 
Anybody else? I would else? just like to um, encourage you to go to the Washington Welcome Housing Alliance website. I'm on there. It's the action alert where I get yep. the update of yep. advocacy for the week and what's going on and what's being heard and what I'm supposed to call the legislator about. Yeah. I find that fascinating. And then join me in thanking Ben 